This talk is on the corrupt origins of central banking in America and, uh, and uh, why I think that's uh, an interesting topic and uh, an important topic is, uh, you know, I briefly mentioned in my talk yesterday uh, the origins of antitrust and natural monopoly regulation. And some of the research I've done over the years uh, uh, has to do with uh, sort of curiosity over the origins of government institutions because it's often true that they're built on a, a big mountain of myths uh, as far as you know what, what they are. And the myths sometimes last for generations and, and it becomes the accepted truth. And so you know, I found that the, the whole story that's in all the textbooks about any trust is, is, is dubious. Uh, and, uh, and, and why you, uh, any economist should have been skeptical about it is there's a huge literature on the actual enforcement of antitrust that go for a hundred years, and you know, uh, article after article, book after book, is about how it's been, uh, you know, so counterproductive and actually harms competition rather than helps it. And the same with uh, natural monopoly. Uh, you know, there, there used to be a journal that was very popular among economists called the Bell Journal of Economics. It was the uh, uh, the uh, Bell Telephone Company funded it in in. Uh, and it had just hundreds and hundreds of articles about the problems involved in regulating public utilities. And so, and, and there were just generations of economists wrote all these articles about the inefficiencies caused by regulation of public utilities in the Bell Journal. But still, they would argue that, but, but it was needed in the first place. You know, there was market failure. We needed regulation of utilities in the first place. And then we put it in place and these foolish and, or stupid, corrupt people messed it up. And so, uh, and so you know, I, I usually smell a big rat when I hear stories like that. Yeah, we, we messed up for 100 years, but it was, it was a good idea at the beginning. And, uh, and, and with central banking, you know, I began looking into central banking. And of course, uh, uh, you know, there many books have been written. There's some treatises, you know, Murray Rothbard's uh, uh, history of mon uh, money and banking in the United States is great. Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz wrote a treatise on uh, uh, history of mon monetary history of the United States. Richard Timber Timberlake uh, also wrote a, a treatise. And Alan Meltzer wrote a history of the Federal Reserve. Alan Meltzer is a famous Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon professor uh, who wrote from a Chicago school prof uh, perspective for many years uh, on monetary policy, monetary issues. And so in all these books and articles, you know, catalog problems caused by the Fed. And then there's, there's stories about corruption caused by the Fed or central banking. Uh, you know, a recent example would be, uh, uh, it's sort of an outrageous example, when, uh, when uh, President Bush's uh, uh, Treasury Secretary, uh, Paulson, Henry Paulson, left Goldman Sachs. And I believe it's in the U.S. Constitution that the Treasury Secretary must be an employee of Goldman Sachs. I'm pretty sure I've, I'll have to check with Judge Napolitano about that, but it, it seems certain. Uh, uh, to become Treasury Secretary, he orchestrates a bailout of the insurance company AIG, which owed Goldman Sachs $18 billion. And they get, I don't know, what was it, uh, 80 some billion dollars from the government, and they paid back Goldman Sachs. Henry leaves the government, goes back to Goldman Sachs, and I pick up the New York Times one day and in, the, in the society section. I was on an airplane, so I was reading the whole thing. You know, you're getting bored on a long airplane ride at the New York Times Sunday edition. And there's a big article about the big, beautiful, new $5 million house that Mrs. Paulson just bought, you know, the, her 10th her uh, house somewhere. And so, you know, there's stories like that about corruption. And so, uh, and so, but what is usually said is that well, it was a good idea at the beginning. There were market failure. The, the financial system wasn't, was falling apart. We needed the central banking. But, you know, for the past 100 and, 100 and some years, we, we messed up. <laughs> yeah. And so just like natural monopoly and just like uh, uh, antitrust, I smell a rat. And so I, I looked in. Uh, started looking into the very origins. Murray Rothbard wrote a lot widely about this too. And in his book, The Mystery of Banking, uh, he, he's, you know, there were two national banks before the Fed. There was the Bank of North America was the very first national bank. And that was succeeded by something called the Bank of the United States. And, uh, and a mover and shaker behind uh, the first national bank 
was a financier Robert Morris, who uh, uh, some, some historians say he was the uh, financier of the American Revolution. Uh, Rothbard called him uh, a defense contractor who made money off the American Revolution, which is more true, I think, about who Robert Morris was, a Philadelphia, uh, very wealthy businessman, you know, possibly the wealthiest man in America in the late 18th century. Okay, and so after the American Revolution, he's a, he was a native of Liverpool, England, and here's what he and his, his big business compatriots in Philadelphia and New York and, and Boston basically wanted, and I'm quoting Rothbard from page 192, what they wanted was, quote, to reimpose in the new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, and launch a massive system of internal public works. That would be corporate welfare for road and canal building. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain. And uh, when I talk about this, uh, I usually uh, make the point that, uh, <clears throat> that this is absolutely true. This, the revolution is over. They just fought a revolution against the rotten British mercantilist system. And then they had these group of people led by Robert Morris who wanted to bring the exact same system to America. And you can understand why their political opponents, the Jeffersonians, were outraged at this and, and opposed it every step along the way uh, for that very reason. But uh, when I first read about this, it reminded me of uh, this old movie. I think it's History of the World Part Two or Part One. I forget what part. And Mel Brooks portrays the King of France during the French Revolution. And his, his laugh line in the movie is it's good to be the king. Every, you know, he's sitting on a big pile of gold bars. It's good to be the king. And, and, and every time, in, in the big laugh line. And that, that was basically their, their attitude that mercantilism is a rotten system if you're on the paying end. But if you're on the collecting end, it's pretty good. If, you can, if you're, on the, you're on that side. And these, these people wanted to be on the collecting end of the mercantilist system. After all, it, it existed in Europe for, for hundreds of years because, for a reason. It was very profitable to somebody, and, and th these people wanted to be the somebody in America. Okay? An important part of the Morris scheme, with, I always loved Rothbard's language, like scheme, racket. He, he wasn't afraid to call these things what they were. Was, and I'm quoting again, to organize and head a central bank to provide cheap credit and expanded money for himself and his allies. The Bank of North America was deliberately modeled after the Bank of England. And so this... And so mercantil a short definition of mercantilism it basically is a, a, a collection of policies that benefit producers at the expense of consumers. Protectionism, corporate uh, welfare subsidies, uh, that, that sort of thing, uh, grants of monopoly franchises, all, all that, so that's mercantilism. And so they succeeded. They got the government to create this Bank of North America and there was a law passed where no other banks were allowed to, to exist in the country. It was given literally a monopoly in banking. And, but the people became so suspicious of the currency that they were issuing and, and uh, suspicious that it was not backed by gold or silver <clears throat> that uh, the bank's currency uh, became valueless and the bank collapsed and was privatized in the year 1783. So it only lasted about a year because there was so little public confidence in this, this scheme, as Rothbard called it. But they never gave up. And, and, you know, long after Morris died, you know, there was still a successive generation of, of mercantilists who wanted to impose mercantilism on, on Americans. And so uh, Rothbard says that, well, um, uh, he, he recruited uh, a youthful disciple, a youthful disciple. And the youthful disciple was Alexander Hamilton. Uh, the, the young lawyer uh, who had been George Washington's uh, adjutant general and, and uh, protege in the, in the American Revolution. So he was very close to the president, George Washington. And uh, 
in, 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 the, in the Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Hamilton, Ron Chernow, that's C-H-E-R-N-O-W, Ron Chernow, the Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Alexander Hamilton, he wrote how it was that Hamilton got the job as Treasury Secretary. So Robert Morris got Hamilton the job as Treasury Secretary by writing George Washington. And, uh, and Chernow writes here that uh, Hamilton uh, mentioned this, and, uh, and Washington knew about it because he got a letter from Robert Morris. Uh, in, uh, in, in the letter, he, he turns to uh, Alexander Hamilton and said, uh, I didn't know you knew anything about finance. We never talked about it. And so, uh, but here he was, he wanted him to be the first Treasury Secretary. Okay, so what Hamilton did, here's what Chernow says. Hamilton brushed up on money matters. He didn't know anything. He, he knew less than anybody in his room about, about econo economics uh, of, of his day. Uh, and had Colonel Timothy Pickering. This was, uh, this was a, a Massachusetts senator. He was a Secretary of State and Secretary of War under George Washington. So this was, and this was a man who knew something about economics. He was educated, Timothy Pickering. And Pickering sent him some primers, David Hume's Political Discourses, <clears throat> tracts written by the English clergyman and polemicist Richard Price, Oh, I'm sure you've all read Richard Price, you know, the students of economics, whoever he was, and his all-purpose crib, Postlewaite's Universal Dictionary of Trade and Commerce. So he read a dictionary. Hamilton sent a marathon letter to, to uh, Morris that set forth a full-fledged system for shoring up American credit and creating a national bank. And in the letter, he basically said, uh, I think it would be a good idea if we did all these things that I quoted to you a minute ago. That, uh, that the Murray Rothbard said, you know, national bank, high protectionist tariffs, big public debt, and all that. And in the letter, it's an April 30th, 1781 letter to Robert Morris by Hamilton advocating protectionist tariffs, a central bank, taxes on land, that is property taxes, poll taxes, and a large public debt. Okay, and Robert Morris thought, this is great, I love this. And so he, so he, got, the, he got the job. And so, so basically, Hamilton became the political water carrier for Robert Morris and the other uh, big money people from New York and Philadelphia. Basically, that's why uh, when they held the Constitutional Convention and Hamilton showed up and advocated a king, he called it a permanent president, uh, and they rejected it, he left in a huff and went back to New York. And he wasn't even there, he stayed for a day or two and then he left, wasn't interested, okay? Uh, and for example, Hamilton said this, I was among the first who were convinced that an administration by single men was essential to the proper management of the affairs of this country. Management by single men. That, not single as opposed to married versus single, but one person. <laughs> one person. A king. Okay. And he, so he, he became a big advocate of uh, a central bank as, you know, because that's what Morris wanted. And here's what are some of the things that uh, Hamilton began saying about the virtues of a national bank. Uh, I'm quoting him, Great Britain is indebted for the immense efforts she has been able to make in so many illustrious and successful wars because of the existence of the Bank of England. How could you, how could you miss out on that? And he spoke of imperial glory. You know, a lot of, a lot of the British uh, warmongers uh, you know, reveled in the imperial glory of, of war. And, and he thought that Americans would also like to have imperial glory. And, but you need a bank, uh, to, to, uh, a national bank to do that. Okay, so in short, the, fir the purpose of the, Mary the first bank was to grow the state uh, bigger than the Constitution would allow and finance an empire. Okay, and so <clears throat> Jefferson was always very suspicious of Hamilton. And he grew to hate the man, although, they, although they, he respected him as a, as a major intellect. And, and he was also very Machiavellian. You know, he was, uh, the reason why he wanted a large public debt, he, he called it a, a, a blessing, a large public debt, national debt. Uh, the reason he gave was that the wealthier people of the country would be the ones who would be buying government bonds. And they, they, therefore, would become a powerful lobbying force in favor of higher taxes <clears throat> and bigger government because they would want to make sure there was always enough money in the treasury to pay off the principal and interest on their bonds. And so it was very, very knack back here. And he was out in the open for this. Back, 
back in those days, politicians, I guess, were, were not, uh, not quite as big a liars as they are today. They just come right out and said it. And it's, you know, it's, on, it's, on, it's all over the place in the history books. Okay. <clears throat> and so he was quite the Machiavellian. Here's how one of the editors of the Federalist Papers described Hamilton as Treasury Secretary. He said, with devious brilliance, Hamilton set out by a program of class legislation to unite the propertied interests of the eastern seaboard into a cohesive administration party, while at the same time he attempted to make the executive dominant over the Congress by a lavish use of the spoils system, that is, handing out government jobs to supporters. So he couldn't get a king, but he wanted the executive branch to be dominant over the Congress or the judiciary, the next best thing to a king. Uh, <clears throat> in carrying out his scheme, Douglas Adair wrote, the editor of the Federalist Papers, Hamilton transformed every financial transaction of the Treasury Department into an orgy of speculation and graft in which selected senators, congressmen, and certain of their richer constituents throughout the nation participated, that is, benefited from. And so he was using the money in the Treasury Department to, to pay off members of Congress and some of the wealthier business people in the country for their political support. Political support for what? Political support for what Hamilton coined as the American system. This, this quote that I read at the beginning, where they wanted uh, protectionist tariffs, a national bank, and subsidies for corporations of all sorts, that was the British mercantilist system, but Hamilton called it the American system. This was long before George Orwell wrote 1984. You know, we would call that Orwellian now, but uh, that word didn't exist in the in the in the late 19th, late 18th century, of course. But it was or Orwellian. It's you know, black is white, night night is day, you know, light is dark. Um, it's, it's it's pretty much the same thing, and so <clears throat> so that's what he did. And one of the first things that Hamilton did as, as president, and these are all things I'm explaining to you because, this, because the, uh, the uh, important part of this story is what Jefferson had to say about all this and its connection to the bank, to why we, to why we got a, a central bank. So what, uh, what he did was the, the American Revolution was financed by the state governments. Uh, there, was, there was no national financing of it. I mean, in, in, in early America, each state thought of itself as a country in the same sense that Great Britain and Spain and France was, were countries. You know, Virginia was a country, Massachusetts was a country, and they had a confederacy of countries that fought to uh, secede against from the British Empire. Okay, and so, and they, and they raised what tax money they could and they borrowed money also, you know, as states. Hamilton nationalized all this debt, all this state debt, most of it being war debt, okay. And here's the, here's the, the way he nationalized it, though. The insiders in New York, the, the national capital was in New York City at the time. It was New York and Philadelphia, and then they created Washington, D.C., out of, uh, carved it out of Virginia. But uh, the New Yorkers, the congressmen and the political insiders, knew that there was a piece of legislation that was going to say that this war debt that was trading between 2 and 10% of face value would be bought up at 100% of face value at some point. And this was before the internet to all the young students in the class. This was long before the internet you know, that happened. And so what happened is the insiders, you know, talk about insider trading, they hired stage coaches, ships, boats, men on horseback, anybody, anyone and anything to go up and down the eastern seaboard buying up bonds, mostly held by Revolutionary War veterans because they ran out of money and they paid them in promises in government bonds. <clears throat> and these were trading between 2 and 10% of face value. But the insiders knew that they can get their hands on these bonds, that in a month or two they can cash them in at 100% face value. <clears throat> Here's how, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a, a historian named Claude Bowers who wrote a book called Jefferson and Hamilton. Okay, he also wrote a, a famous book uh, on the Reconstruction called The Tragic Era, uh, you know, post-Civil War era. But here's what he said about what happened next. Express it, <clears throat> expresses, by what he meant, stagecoaches, <clears throat> with, with very large sums of money on their way to the North Carolina, went for purpose of speculation 
in certificates, splashed and bumped over wretched winter roads, two fast-selling vessels chartered by a member of Congress who had been an officer in the war were plowing the waters southward on a similar mission. And so there was a mad scramble to buy up all these bonds. And so these men became very wealthy. Among the men who became wealthy, Robert Morris himself made $18 million. <clears throat> this, is, this is in the, the late 1700s, $18 million. Governor George Clinton of New York made $5 million. Hamilton himself purchased the bonds through buying agents in Philadelphia and New York. Okay, and so, <clears throat> and so in, then in, stops, in steps Jefferson. Uh, he, and Jefferson is, is watching all of this and observing all of this. And he wrote an essay in, on February 4th, 1818. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson wrote an essay about uh, Hamilton's financial system. He says this, Hamilton's financial system had two objects. Uh, first, as a puzzle to exclude popular understanding and inquiry. Secondly, as a machine for the corruption of the legislature. What he was talking about is uh, Hamilton had written these big, long-winded reports that are typical of lawyers, in which he was. One was called Report on Manufacturers, then there was a report on the National Bank, and they were very long-winded and obtuse and filled with all sorts of language that no one would understand hardly. And, and so Jefferson is saying, well, the purpose of these, these reports is to confuse the public and befuddle the public, bamboozle the public so they wouldn't know what on earth is going on with their money. And this, but the second purpose, Jefferson said, was corruption. And so uh, what was he talking about? Well, Jefferson had come to the conclusion that after watching this, this arbitrage that was orchestrated by Hamilton, that what he was doing was buying votes for members of Congress when he made po these politicians millionaires in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 18th century, they're millionaires. Uh, well, they would vote for whatever he wanted them to vote for, protectionist tariffs, existence of a national bank, subsidies uh, for road building corporations, whatever they want. After all, he's the man who made them wealthy. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. And here's what Jefferson said about Hamilton. He avowed, Hamilton did, uh, the opinion that man could be governed by one of two motives only, force or interest, that is self-interest. Force, he observed, in this country was out of the question. You know, it's not a totalitarian state. And the interest, therefore, of the members must be laid hold of to keep the legislature in unison with the executive. Uh, they remember Hamilton wanted a king, but, he had a, that, but we didn't get a king, so there's a big problem there. You've got the legislature to deal with. How can you get the legislature and the king, the president, to be one? Well, bribery. Okay, in other words... Uh, and the interest, therefore, the members must be hold, uh, laid hold of to keep the legislature in union with the executive. And with grief and shame, it must be acknowledged that his machine was not without effect. That even in this, the birth of our government, some members were found sordid enough to bend their duty to their interests and to look after personal rather than the public good. So that was Jefferson. Okay, the way uh, Jefferson put it was, men thus enriched by the dexterity of a leader would follow, of course, the chief who was leading them to fortune and thus become his zealous instruments. Okay, they would vote for whatever he wanted to vote for. Okay, but the big problem, Jefferson said, was that this was a one-time only deal, this arbitrage, the, the nationalization of the debt was a one-time thing. Uh, you know, and members of Congress will retire, they'll die. What was the average age of a man back then? 45, something like that. Uh, and, so, uh, and so this couldn't be a permanent engine of, of government. You, you need something more permanent there. And what, what might that be? Okay. And in Jefferson's own words, he said, quote, some engine of influence more permanent must be contrived. And he's not saying he wants this permanent engine. He's saying... In Hamilton's view, some permanent engine uh, of influence must be contrived. And what might that be? Well, he next talks about a dinner <clears throat> that was held at Monticello, uh, Jefferson's home, would be with uh, himself, Hamilton, Secretary of War Henry Knox, John Adams, and U.S. Attorney General Edmund Randolph. This is in 1791. Okay. And Jefferson wrote on this essay, he said, about what he wrote in, he said, 
for the truth of which I attest the God who made me. So you know, honest to God, this is the truth about what happened at this dinner. <clears throat> and uh, so they're having a conversation and John Adams, the, the president, you know, John Adams, the president, says, he's talking about the British Constitution. He says, purge that Constitution of its corruption and give to its popular branch, the legislature, equality of representation, that is with the, the executive, and it would be the most perfect constitution ever devised by the wit of man. So, so there's John Adams saying the British constitution is, uh, is, is a perfect system if it weren't for the corruption. Ham Alexander Hamilton steps in and says, oh no, it's the corruption that makes it perfect. He, sa he, he says this, he, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, he says, purge it of its corruption and give to its popular branch equality of representation, and it would become an impracticable government. As it stands at present, with all its supposed defects, it is the most perfect government which ever existed. That was, that was Hamilton. He said, no, we want corruption. You, you, we, we need corruption because government is too small without corruption. You need, you need the corruption. You know, after all, when the Constitution was uh, ratified, uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton threw a fit and denounced it as a frail and worthless fabric because it didn't create a big enough government uh, that, that he wanted. He was constantly badgering George Washington saying, we need a government of more energy. That's, I quote him in my book uh, saying that several times. And so, and so how can we achieve this? How can we achieve this, this permanent regime? Uh, well, <clears throat> there's the, the reason for the central bank. And here's what uh, Jefferson said about this. He said, Hamilton was so bewitched and perverted by the British example as to be under thorough conviction that corruption was essential to the government of a nation. And that is why he wanted a central bank. Okay, see, the bank would be a permanent engine of corruption, like it was uh, earlier. It could be used to, uh, to fund polit uh, politicians, to, to, to dish out all sorts of benefits, to provide cheap credit, to uh, politically connected businesses who would then uh, uh, round up support for you. And so all of these people who were paid off, the members of Congress and, and various citizens out there who were supporters of the government, uh, they need money to pay them off. And of course, a national bank run by politicians uh, would be just a trick, it would be just a thing. And so, and so uh, Thomas Jefferson's interpretation of why the original proponents of a central bank wanted a central bank was uh, that it would be an engine of corruption. <clears throat> and those are Jefferson's exact words, an engine of corruption. And so, uh, and so the point, point I make from uh, my beginning remark is that uh, if you understand this history, then, uh, and you see things like uh, Paul, Henry Paulson uh, leaving Goldman Sachs, going to the, uh, into the government, into the Treasury, and then the Fed financing a, an $80 billion bailout of, uh, of, of people who owed his company money. That, well, that, was, that sort of thing was always the purpose of a central bank. It's not just that there are corrupt people from time to time who, who get in there and corrupt the system. It was, the system was built to be like that, and it's inherent in the system. It's not, it's not just a quirk. Uh, it's not just a quirk that happens over and over again for 200 years, in, in other words. You know, you know, what a coincidence. Okay, and so that's what it was. So, and so, uh, so we got that, uh, the, the Bank of the United States, and that's an interesting story too. If you read some of the history books about how we got the Bank of the United States, Jefferson and Hamilton had a, a debate. They each were asked to write their opinions of, the, of this to George Washington, and, uh, and, of course, Jefferson was opposed to it. He, he pointed out that they debated having a national bank at the Constitutional Convention and rejected the idea. And that would seem to be pretty good evidence that the founding fathers of America did not want a national bank. Uh, but, but then uh, 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 Hamilton came back and said, well, if you read between the lines, there are implied powers of the, con of the Constitution, not just the delegated powers in Article One, Section 8, but there are implied powers in the uh, and Jefferson came back and essentially said, I've read between the lines and there's just blank space. I don't see anything in there. He didn't use those exact words, but that's in effect what, what he said. But uh, George Washington did sign off on it. Uh, and you can read in the history books of how uh, he owned a great deal of land in Virginia, uh, Mount Vernon, 
and uh, they were in the process of creating Washington, D.C., and he told the Federalist Party leaders, his party, that if you extend the border of uh, Washington, D.C. right to Mount Vernon, I'll sign off on the bill for this bank that you want. So he did that. So it was a, a horse trade uh, or log rolling between George Washington and uh, the leaders of the Federalist Party. So we got the Bank of the United States, and it had a 20-year charter, and the charter was not renewed because guess what? It created massive corruption and economic instability. And so, and so it was not renewed after, after uh, 20, the first 20 year charter uh, and that, that existed. <clears throat> and then the, the War of 1812 came and to monetize the debt of the war, they resurrected the Bank of the United States. The second Bank of the United States came into being in uh, 1816 mostly to monetize the debt that had been run up from the war, the War of 1812. And Hamilton is dead by this time. <clears throat> Jefferson lived until uh, 1826, I think it was. But, uh, but Hamilton died in 1804, uh, shot in a duel with Aaron Burr. And uh, our friend uh, Gary North used to uh, have a, started up a little so- society called the Aaron Burr Society, and they made ball caps, he told me, it said, not soon enough. It was sort of the, the logo on the, on, the, on the ball cap of the, the Aaron Burr Society. And, uh, and so, but anyway, so we get the second bank of the United States. It's 1816, eight, January of 1817 uh, that's created. And who remembers the title of Murray Rothbard's doctoral dissertation that's published as a book? Panic of 1819. And I always thought it was just a little more than just a coincidence that we had the Bank of the United States created in the 18th, January of 1817, and, right away, and we have the first major depression in America in 1819. They were called panics back then. It was, uh, it was um, Herbert Hoover who decided that depression would be a, more, a, a better word than panic. So we call them depressions and recessions, but, that, but they were called panics back then. And so the Bank of the United States existed again uh, and, uh, but, it, but then its biggest enemy became uh, Andrew Jackson. When Andrew Jackson was president in the late 1820s, he vetoed the rechartering of the Second Bank of the United States. And, uh, and he had, there was a big battle with, that, uh, with uh, the bank and the supporters of the bank who were powerful people like Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House of the Representatives, and Daniel Webster uh, was a was a, from Ma- the Massachusetts senator, was a big supporter, and he was also on the, uh, on the take from the, from the bank. Uh, Henry Clay, by the way, uh, resigned from the government, a position uh, in, in government, to become the general counsel of the Bank of the United States because he had run up $40,000 in gambling debt in Washington, D.C. And this is in the 1820s, $40,000 in gambling debt. And so in, in two years, he made enough money from being the, the lawyer for the Bank of the United States to pay off his $40,000 debt and then some. And so you can do the math of what, uh, how much money that would be today of, of, of that. So, so it led to all this kind of corruption. So Andrew Jackson comes along and, and says this. Here's one of the things he says about the, the second Bank of the United States. He said, every monopoly and all exclusive privileges are granted at the expense of the public, and that the many millions which this act, that is the rechartering of the Bank of the United States, proposes to bestow on the stockholders of the existing bank must come directly or indirectly out of the earnings of the American people. And he says, these stockholders were profiting from their connection with the government only, and not any, and not any productive efforts on their part. And so there were private stockholders, and then it was also partly uh, capitalized by tax dollars. I think 20% was capitalized by tax dollars. And, uh, and it was an engine of corruption. And so he vetoed the rechartering of the bank. But he, he also had help along the way. Uh, there's an interesting story here about the state of Ohio, what they did when, when they tried to open up two branches of the Bank of the United States in the state of Ohio. The people of Ohio did not want this because they knew uh, there were Jeffersonians in their opinion of uh, a national bank. And they knew it spelled in- economic instability and corruption. And so they imposed a tax of $50,000 a year on each branch of, of the, the Bank of the United States. And the Bank of the United States refused to pay. So they sent armed marshals into the banks with big chests to, to fill up with money. And they did. They walked into the vaults, took 
you know, uh, you know, took fifty thousand dollars out of the vault and left uh, over this. In the in other states, uh, objected to the, you know, the Supreme Court case McCulloch versus Maryland, which the judge uh, has talked about or will be talking about, uh, was involved in this too, where Maryland wanted to tax it, uh, this out of into oblivion, and that's where John Marshall, the Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, uh, came up with this phrase, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Well, the people in states like Ohio and Maryland wanted to destroy the Bank of the United States by taxing it out of existence from the state level. That's where that comes from uh, with John Marshall. And so he had help there. And uh, if, if, if you want to read uh, Andrew Jackson's veto message, uh, you can just Google uh, Andrew Jackson, why U.S. Bank was closed. And, uh, and you can read it online. It's very interesting. You, you never see a politician uh, say anything like that these days. Uh, after I read this, this thing, uh, I was curious as to what historians had to say about this. And if you pick up the history books, it's, it's pretty much uniformly derogatory comments about what, a, what an ignorant old farmer Andrew Jackson was. And, but but it, it sounds like it could have been written by either Jefferson or Murray Rothbard. Yeah, the, 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 the condemnation of the special interest in the, in the bank, or maybe co-authored by the two of them. And I think it's one of the great uh, statements ever made by an American politician, Andrew Jackson's veto of the Bank of the United States and his con condemnation of, of all of this, which is, of course, is why the historians hate it and, and don't like him. And, uh, and as you all know, Trump, uh, Trump has a huge picture of Andrew Jackson in, in the Oval Office. Every time I see him on TV and he's in the Oval Office, there's a big picture of I think it's the Oval Office, a big picture of Andrew Jackson. And I don't know if it's because he knows about the bank or, uh, or that, just, that Andrew Jank Jackson was, uh, was hated by so many people like him. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's why they, a, kin a kinship with that, you know, that might be. And so, so you know, that bank uh, became, uh, was defunct. Uh, this was by the early 1830s. By 1840, there was no longer a national bank uh, in uh, Although Lincoln uh, imposed, uh, sort of nationalized the currency with the National Currency Acts and the Legal Tender Acts in the 1860s, but we didn't get the Fed until 1913. So that was, uh, so, so we went all this way. We, I don't have time to talk about what, what went on in the meantime. Although uh, uh, Richard Timberlake's uh, book, his treatise on uh, uh, history of uh, monetary history in the United States, uh, he argues, as, as do a few other people, that this period from 1840 to, 18, to the 1860s was probably the most stable, monetary, stable, monetarily stable period of American history. It wasn't perfect, so there were bankruptcies and things, but he says, he, he argues that, that compared to the rest of, the, of history, that it was probably the most stable monetary system we ever had in the, in the United States. There were competing currencies, uh, like, uh, you know, the word Dixie, we're in Dixie now, the South is known as Dixie, the land Dixie. There's even a song, Dixie. Well, the, the Dix was uh, the $10 note published by a New Orleans bank. That's 10 in French. And, so, and the Dix was so stable that it was even used in Minnesota. Um, in uh, my last trip to New Orleans, I actually saw they still have the, the building that was once a bank that issued that currency. There's a little plaque on the side of the, this old uh, building that was once a bank. And so we had competing currencies like that for quite a while, but that was all snuffed out when, uh, when Lincoln passed the National Currency Acts and the Legal Tender Acts, they, they imposed a tax on competing currencies. So it's hard to business. If you and I are in business and we each have an ice cream stand and the government has a big tax on your ice cream stand but not mine, uh, that's a bit of an advantage. And, so, and if I'm the government, I'm gonna make sure that I can drive you out of the market with my tax. So, that, so that's what happened. And so that's, uh, that's my story for now, and I'm sticking to it, that, uh, that there always was, the purpose of central banking always, always was, at least in part, corruption. Uh, and so it's not just an accident, it's inherent. And uh, class dismissed. Uh, <laughs>